Marcus Junius Pura, Consul 230, Censor 225, and Dictator 216 BCE. Typically speaking, most people's understanding of the Second Punic War goes something like this. Hannibal came into Italy, started raising hell, and only the caution of Fabius Maximus and his Fabian strategy enabled Rome to survive long enough for its other generals abroad to win enough victories to force Hannibal out of Italy. The Fabian strategy weakened Hannibal over time through attrition, and this combined with victories overseas led to the eventual victory. While it is an oversimplification, it's not wrong. However, one thing that it does do is to really just present Rome as a two-general republic. You have Fabius in Italy as the shield, and you have Scipio in Spain as the sword. There, it, the situation, as you might imagine, is quite a bit more complicated than this, and one of the key pieces to the puzzle is Marcus Junius Pura. Not only did Pura take over for Fabius Maximus as dictator following the devastating defeat at Cannae, but he also cemented the Fabian strategy while also piecing together the Roman army and keeping it in the field during the critical months of late 216 and early 215. After his dictatorship, the Romans would stick with the Fabian strategy, and I'll argue that it was Junius Pura's adoption of that strategy while dictator, which really cemented the Fabian strategy as Rome's official policy. It is also worth mentioning that while Fabius Maximus, when he took over as dictator in 217, did inherit a pretty terrible situation, it was not as desperate as the situation that Junius Pura was called upon to deal with. Junius Pura and his master of horse ended up having to more or less rebuild a Roman army from scratch from a manpower pool that was greatly depleted following two major defeats within the last two years. So, I would argue in many ways, if you're thinking of someone who is an executioner of strategy and not just a formulator, in many ways, you can make the case that Junius Pura was more important to the Roman war effort than nearly anyone else in the war, or at least as important as anyone who's not named Fabius, Marcellus, or Scipio Africanus. Any wealthy patrician in Rome could expect a fairly easy path politically. However, if you were a descendant of one of the two liberators, such as Marcus Junius Brutus, then your path was all but guaranteed. And in that sense, Marcus Junius Pura was very, very fortunate. His family, the Junius family, was perhaps the most patrician of all the patrician families, yet it is possible, if not probable, that the Pura branch of the family, which was started by Marcus's father, was actually plebeian. Nonetheless, it bore the name Junius, and as we'll see, it did not in any way impede the career of either Marcus or his father. The reason that I think that the Pera branch was actually plebeian is because if you look at when Marcus Junius Pera was consul, it turns out that his colleague was clearly a patrician, and by this point you had to have one patrician and one plebeian consul every year. As for Marcus's father, Decimus, he was very successful. He had won two triumphs as consul, and also served as censor. So if there was any plebeian status attached to this family name, it appears that many people in the electorate were not aware of it. We know that Roman voters tended to prefer patrician names, but perhaps just being descended from one of the two liberators was enough to make up for any technicality. Certainly, if the Junius Para name was reasonably well known, the memories would have been relatively fresh about the achievements of Marcus's father by the time that he was of office holding age. Marcus Junius Pura was born around 272 BCE. That is my estimate based on when he became consul. While we don't really know anything about his early career, we can just look at his pedigree and all the things his father achieved and guess fairly reasonably that he most likely achieved every office on the Cursus Honorum during his year. That is to say, the year when he turned the minimum age to hold that office. Now, this curse of the norm was not set in stone until the time of Sola. However, it was more or less a thing that people were already practicing well before the time of Sola. So most likely, 
uh, Junius Pura would have been 42 years old in the year 230 when he became consul. But we don't really have all that much to go on in terms of specific information about his earlier career. In 230, Marcus Junius Pura was elected alongside of his patrician colleague Marcus Aemilius Barbula. Typically, when there was a war in one little region, Rome would only dispatch one consul while leaving the other one behind. In this case, however, Rome was very much thinking of how to consolidate its hold on northern Italy, and we'll see that starting in 230 and continuing throughout the 220s, the Romans will continuously dispatch armies to the north to further subjugate the Gauls who lived north of the Po River. This is more or less the start of an era. It was a little unusual to have both consuls in the field in the same region, especially when Liguria is not terribly large, but in this case it was what was going on, and it appears that both consuls had independent armies. Liguria, for context, is the coastal northwestern region of Italy. The most notable city in the area is Genoa. Both consuls seem to have done okay during this campaign. There aren't really any reports on any outstanding victories, but we also don't hear of any failures. And we also get no indication that either man was able to win a triumph by defeating 5,000 or more enemies. So it was a successful consulship, but not a dream consulship by any stretch of the imagination. While Marcus Junius Pura may have had a somewhat humdrum consulship, his prestige was still high in the eyes of his colleague, and in 225 he was elected to serve alongside of the highly experienced Gaius Claudius Kentho, who had served as consul back in 240, as censor. This censorship was anything but ordinary. Typically, the Romans would hold a census every five years, but in this case, the two censors were allotted 18 months in office, an unprecedentedly long time. Of course, consuls were also responsible for overseeing the Senate roles and potentially booting anyone who wasn't carrying their weight, and no doubt they did that as well, but their main job was to conduct the most thorough census that Rome had ever undertaken up to that point. According to Livy, the two censors at the end of their term reported to the Senate that there were 270,212 male Roman citizens. If you double this number, you get to a pretty good estimate for Rome's total manpower reserves because that would include the allies who would not have been counted as full citizens. Why conduct such a lengthy and thorough census when it typically suffice to get an approximate estimate? Well, there are a couple reasons. One, Rome probably was somewhat curious about the demographic impact of the heavy losses it had sustained, especially at sea, during the First Punic War. The second reason is because it appears that, combined with Rome's obsession with solidifying its hold on northern Italy, that the Romans already foresaw that a second conflict with Carthage was inevitable. Carthage was recovering its strength both at home in Africa and in Spain under the Barcas, and Rome didn't like what they were seeing. They felt that Carthage was most likely going to re seek revenge, especially since Rome had taken advantage of Carthaginian weakness after the war to annex Sardinia and Corsica, and then charge Carthage money for the privilege of giving up more territory. So, in many ways, it is fitting that both of the men involved in the censorship who were so central to Rome's planning and to the debates in the Senate in the years leading up to the war, would later serve such a crucial role in keeping Rome together during a great time of crisis. For those of you who are astute, you will realize that Gaius Claudius Kentho also served as dictator during the Second Punic War, but that's a different story for a different video. To fully appreciate why Rome turned to Marcus Junius Pura to serve as dictator, we have to thoroughly establish the context. Hannibal had invaded Italy successfully in 218, and he won a couple of minor battles. However, those battles, while they were embarrassing, they did not shake Rome's morale. The Romans thought that surely in a pitched battle head-to-head, -head, Hannibal didn't have enough manpower to stand up, and also that Roman valor was superior to whatever a Punic army could bring. This led to a pursuit by Gaius Flaminius in 
217, and it led to a major ambush battle at Lake Trasimene, where a large portion of the Roman army was destroyed by Hannibal. This created an absolute panic in Rome, as no one had foreseen this outcome. In their panic, the Senate turned to Fabius Maximus and gave him six months as dictator in order to set the house straight. Fabius drilled the army, got their morale back up, and he also rebuilt their confidence by avoiding major battles and only fighting skirmishes. For the most part, the Romans were winning these skirmishes, which in the minds of many of Rome's leaders meant that Roman valor was still superior and Roman skill was superior. All you have to do is avoid some kind of ambush. If you have a head-to-head -head battle, you're guaranteed victory. And by the summer of 216, when Fabius's term expired, they elected consuls who were resolved to do just that, especially Varro. In August of that year, Varro and Paulus caught up to Hannibal at a place called Cannae, and they attacked uphill with superior numbers. Depending on how many men were deployed under the two consuls, whether it was as low as 50,000 or as high as 80,000, the result is that all but 10,000 men perished. So it was easily the worst battlefield defeat ever suffered by the Romans, and easily the darkest day of their history for many, many centuries. From a strictly military perspective, of course, the Battle of Cannae is perhaps the most brilliant battlefield victory of all time, as Hannibal managed to lure in an enemy which outnumbered him significantly, effect a double envelopment, and completely or almost completely annihilate that force. The Romans needed someone who could piece the army back together, so they resolved to elect another dictator, and the person who stood out in his colleagues' minds as having the ability to do this, of uh, being able to serve as a second Fabius, as being able to have the military competence to avoid a defeat at the hands of Hannibal, while also inspiring enough confidence to recruit a new army and keep Rome's allies loyal, was none other than Marcus Junius Brutus. Or Pura, excuse me, not Brutus. Brutus was long dead. When he was elected dictator, Junius Pura's first job was to find a master of horse. As was the custom, he chose a man of a younger generation, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, who at this point had still not served as consul, but would present himself as a candidate for that office in about a year's time. Tiberius would prove to be a capable and loyal master of horse, unlike Minucius, who had some problems following Fabius' strategy. This man, for context, is the great uncle of the Gracchi brothers from the next century. The task facing the dictator and his master of horse was to raise a new army to replace the one which had been destroyed at Cannae and hold Hannibal at bay at a time when Hannibal had freedom of movement and could move on any of Rome's allies and try to force their defection. There also was a massive loss of senators which occurred at Cannae. Many of the leading lights of that body had perished in battle, including the former master of horse Minucius who served as a subordinate. The consul Paulus had died, and there were quite a number of people of lesser rank who also had perished. With so many senators dead, there were a number of vacancies and the body could not function as designed without replacements. So, because Junius Pura and Gracchus were so busy with strictly military duties, the Romans decided to take an unprecedented step and appoint a second dictator. Now, this would have been confusing to a whole lot of people, and it really could have created more butting of heads reminiscent of when Minucius was given equal power to Fabius for a brief period of time. However, luckily for Rome, this second dictator, Marcus Fabius Buteo, had the wisdom to do his job as quickly as possible and immediately step down. Perhaps he felt embarrassed at impinging on the authority of Junius Pura as dictator, but at any rate, Buteo actually ended up doing Junius Pura a great favor by taking care of this immense task of finding people who had the requisite wealth and some political something to warrant being placed in the Senate. So Buteo is also a man worthy of note.
but unfortunately outside of his job as the co-dictator in 216, not enough is known about him for him to receive his own video. Much like his predecessor's dictator, Fabius Maximus, Per approved to be cautious and to focus on rebuilding the Roman army while avoiding any direct conflict with Hannibal. Pura and Gracchus both engaged heavily in raising fresh troops to replace the fallen, even going so far as to lower the draft age and put teenagers into the ranks, while also freeing and arming 8,000 slaves who were then placed under the personal command of Gracchus. This unit would remain under his command even after the expiration of his time as master of horse, and while this most likely was Gracchus's own idea, Pura had to approve of it, and this shows that he was thinking outside of the box. It also shows the desperation of the times, since the Romans were always loath to arm slaves. I can't help but think, based on what I know of Fabius Maximus, that had he been dictator at this time, he would most likely have shot down this plan to arm slaves and free them. So Pura did put his own stamp on the Fabian strategy. Anytime you have a general strategy, it will manifest itself in somewhat different ways depending on who is doing the implementation. And in this case, I think we see the influence of Pura. So while he essentially did revert to the Fabian strategy of shadowing and not engaging Hannibal, he did actively dispatch Gracchus as needed to fight Carthaginian detachments. It appears that Pura was trying to enact a part of the Fabian strategy which said that you should fight where Hannibal is not. One success that Pura and Gracchus achieved in late 216 is when they heard that the Roman garrison at Casalinum was really running low on supplies, and so Junius Pura dispatched Gracchus to relieve the city and prevented it from falling into Hannibal's hands. Other than that, there are no real confirmed victories or even really battles from this period. However, there is one interesting story from a later source that I'd like to discuss. If we are to believe the 12th century Byzantine historian Zenaris, Junius Pura actually does have a military claim to fame, albeit not a terribly positive one. Pura, as we noted, was trying to avoid battle with Hannibal at all cost, and Hannibal, for his part, wanted to follow up Cannae by fighting a demoralized and largely untrained Roman army. So Hannibal resolved to assault a Roman fortified camp. If you know anything about Rome's marching camps, you know that they were famously difficult to attack, and that the Romans deliberately recreated the same camp every single night and that no enemy ever carried a Roman marching camp by assault. Well, according to Zenaris, that wasn't true, and in fact, the person who was the victim of having his marching camp taken was none other than Pura. What Hannibal did, according to Zenaris, is to feint and attack Pura on one side. Pura had to respond by shifting a lot of his forces around, and he managed to repel the first wave. It was a convincing feint, and the attack was strong enough that Pura thought he had won the day. However, Hannibal's main force then struck from a different direction, taking advantage of Pura's distraction and managed to overrun the entire camp. If this is true, and I don't think that it is, then it is the first and only time that a fortified Roman camp was successfully assaulted. Although it is worth noting that since Junius Pura's army clearly survived, and that since Junius Pura did not die while in office, that his retreat was masterful. So um, the fact that any army would be able to survive having their camp overrun and still be intact is suspicious in itself, and that more than anything else tips me off that this story is most likely a later invention written by some armchair historian at a later date who was then copied by Zenaris, um, because the chances that an, an army could lose its camp and not be massively demoralized and take huge losses is just not very high. It is very difficult to escape a situation where there is a successful assault on a fortified position with limited entrances and exits. So most likely this story is false, yet I thought I would share it with you because it's pretty interesting either way.
By the time that he relinquished the power of the dictatorship, Marcus Junius Pura was about 56 years old. We don't know when he died, however, I think that it's safe to say, given the success of his dictatorship, that he remained a leading light in the Roman Senate until he died. It would be interesting to know what his actual role was after his dictatorship, and it's unfortunate that we don't know more about the proceedings of the Senate, especially during the period when Fabius Maximus and others were actively trying to undermine Scipio Africanus after he achieved a great number of successes in Spain. At any rate, we do know that Marcus Junius Pura and other senior members of the Senate played a pivotal role in guiding Rome through the war, and that while his role may have been overshadowed by the influence of people like Fabius Maximus and Marcus Claudius Marcellus and Scipio Africanus, that Junius Pura and men like him were very much still vital to Rome's war effort. Junius Pura kept Rome together in the darkest hour of its darkest day. Rather than taking offense to the appointment of a co-dictator in Buteo, Junius Pura instead stayed focused on the task of rebuilding the Roman army, and he defended Rome's allies successfully during the darkest days of the war, upholding and indeed cementing the Fabian strategy. While no doubt it was controversial among the officers assembled when Pura approved of Gracchus's plan to free and arm slaves, this proved to be a good risk as these men would acquit themselves well and Gracchus would praise them a few years later when they won a fairly significant victory for him. While Junius Pura is not one of the great captains of history and perhaps not even close to being the greatest Roman of his own generation, he was still a major player and he deserves some respect and at least a passing mention. Hopefully this passing mention has been sufficient.